Are you in a church? Are you listening to a message that is basically the underpinnings are greed, to gain, to profit, of someone who is proud, someone who is not humble enough before God to say, hey, I've stood here and said to you, if I have made a mistake or I've said otherwise or if things change, I'm going to tell you there's no place for ego in the pulpit. None. But if you are sitting in a corporate body, not being instructed, and you're listening to someone who is basically uh, full of hot air, not teaching you a single space in this book, flee from that. What happens when the church, any church, this church or any other church becomes passive, departs from the book, the vessel that we are intended to use as the sole guide, and the church tends to rest on its glorious past, maybe how great it was 50 years ago or whatever the heyday was for the church. And then you've got people who basically in this day and age are um, thinking, I've heard people say the Bible's archaic and it's not very useful in their eyes. And I'm thinking only a blind person could say that, all right? Only a person who has no knowledge or is ignorant could say that. Uh, because God's word is, of course, timeless. When I think about the Christian faith, I, my mind has to kind of go back a little bit to what people had to contend with in the first century, living as Christians. You know, when we talk about the faith life and how some people talk about how, forgive me, how difficult life is, and it, it's not that it's easy, but I want you to think about first century Christians who basically, just by acknowledging their faith in Christ, would have either faced vicious beasts being ripped to shred as a form of entertainment in Rome, or run the risk of being stoned in Jerusalem for even uttering the fact that they followed Christ after his death and resurrection, let alone if anyone were to engage in pseudo-faith, we know that crucifixion was a form of criminal and capital punishment. But if you so much as uttered the name of Jesus or said you were a follower, that indeed could have been your fate as well. So what I'm saying to you is, in those days, to have someone profess pseudo-faith, there, there wasn't a reason for it. There wasn't people... There wasn't a logic behind that. You either stood your ground and stood strong in the faith. You had conviction. You at least maybe didn't have a Bible because the Bible was not yet, but you had oral transmission and oral tradition and oral teaching that took hold, and it was serious. It wasn't a mockery. People actually had something to be afraid of. And yet when I read some of the history of these people in antiquity, I see great courage, great faith, and then I automatically flip to this day and age and I look at how, I'm sorry, how we've become a society of people who are scared, cowards, fearful, doubting. And to doubt, by the way, is not something, I wouldn't say that's the, the greatest sin you could commit, but I'm talking about the church at large. When I read regarding Paul's concept of battle, the battle is first and foremost for the faith, truth, light, and life of the world. The battle for the soul, of course, the battle for eternity. And warfare, or we'll say warfare has some manifold nature, if we're talking about spiritual warfare, has some manifold nature to it. There is the battle from within and the external forces at work. So... I decided I need to revisit a text I have taught on many times, but maybe with a slightly different angle. So I'm going to ask you, if you have your Bibles, to please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And um, for those who do not have a Bible, I'm actually going to read, beginning at um, verse 3, kind of just jumping in there. If any 
teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind, and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they, listen carefully to this, they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, pierced themselves through many, with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art called. And I'm going to put a period there because I go no further than that for the sake of the message. Eventually, my focus will be on verses 11 and 12, there are several words I'm going to focus on within the body of the text, but I also want to make an application to this message, which would be personally to each and every one of us. And this requires, this requires stopping and thinking. And after I'm done, reflecting. Because a lot of times I say this personally, corporately, People immediately like to just pass the buck down like it's somebody else's issue. But no, it starts with us. So the effects of this personally on ourselves, corporately as the church. And then a third category that I'm, I'm adding, which is not so much how, you know, a lot of times we're concerned about how the world tends to creep into the church. But my concern is, what does the world see spilling out of the church? So personally, corporately, the church body. And then what does the world see of the church? Because I think this is a big problem too, okay? If you put this in proper perspective. Now, I said that we were going to focus on three words, so that is exactly what we're going to do. You, if you want to circle these words, if you just want to put a note somewhere, in your King James, you're going to see... In verse 11, flee, I've circled that. The next one I've circled is follow. And the third one I've circled is fight. So uh, I want to take a look at briefly. You don't need to read Greek. I'm just going to make a few observations. But sometimes when I bring up a Greek word and I say it enough, it sticks with you. So let's try this one on for size. I wrote out the text in, in its entirety, 11 and part of 12, but here's this word right here. And let's put this down as fugi. Fugi. All right, so fugi is the word for flee in your King James. And if you are a Strong's person, that is the concordance that goes with this book, that would be Strong's 5343. Now, if you read and look up the word escape, flee, shun, safety, uh, flight for safety, and look at how it is used in some of the context. For example, in Matthew 2.13, you don't turn there, in Matthew 2.13, it says how an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream telling him to take Mary and the Christ child and to flee into Egypt and says, be there thou there until I bring thee word. So do not make the mistake of making this word a word of paradise or a word of fear. It's actually a word of obedience in this particular context, and it must be noted as so. A lot of times we, we use words, and to flee could mean I'm running for my life, I'm scared, or it could be I'm following God's orders. And if you take the time to look up sometimes where this word appears, you're going to see a lot of times it's people following God's command to flee. When God says go, you better go. That's not cowardice. That's called obedience to the one who's speaking to you or the, to the one who's called you. So 
That's number one. Number two is another word here, dioke, which in your King James will be follow. Now, there are several Greek words for follow. This specific word right here has a particular meaning, and we need to be very careful of how we use it. Uh, it can mean to pursue properly, aggressively, like a hunter chasing a catch, pursuing something you are hunting down, to pursue with haste, earnestly desiring to overtake. From a primitive verb, dio, to put to flight or to seek. Now, this same word, I'm using caution to explain this. This same word has a twofold meaning. In Matthew 5.10, it will appear this way. Blessed are they which are persecuted. That is, those who basically are following Christ. Blessed are those who are persecuted. It's the same word, dioke, persecuted, except you can see following Christ can bring persecution. So it's not just following, pursuing as one who is hunted down. It has a double meaning. You'll find it actually is used many times of persecution. So it has a double meaning, and the grammar decides how it will be interpreted. And, of course, the last word that I want us to look at, agonizu, which in your King James simply says fight. And you actually have it repeated here again, agona. These are the two same words. Agonizu is the verb. Agona is the noun. We get our English word for agony, agonize. Um, pretty, pretty clear. Um, if you would look this word up, struggle, strive, contend with as an adversary. Now, we're armed with three, we'll call them albeit brief definitions of three words. And this is what I want us to try and apply these three words within the confines of the text to better understand flee, follow, and fight personally, corporately, and what the spillover is onto what the world sees. And let me start backwards for a minute. The worst thing that's happened to the church is what the world sees spilling out of it. Garbage. Garbage. You tell me, and, and this is not judgment, this is just observation. You tell me that there are more pastors teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ un, not watered down, not afraid, with full faith. You tell me that there are more of those than more that have sold out to Satan preaching a message of socialism or inclusivism or we have to syncretistically just all hold hands somehow, come together no matter where you're at, putting aside the doctrines of Christ. And this is what the world sees spilling out of the church. Now, it used to be, if you remember, I remember even in my early days here ministering to you, the crazy stuff we saw from that church, that Hillbro church, where they were going nuts over the top in their fundamentalist doctrine, okay? That's taking, swing the pendulum completely the other way, too far, to where you've got somebody standing and basically condemning everybody. Everybody's going to hell because nobody fits into the checkbox of perfection that they painted, which no one ever can. We're all sinners being saved by grace. So this is why I think starting to look at personally how this will apply to me or to you, corporately, the church, and the spillover is very important because failure to understand, I'm just going to say it, failure to understand what we look like to the world is really myopic. And the church has really fallen hard and failed. And I'm not going to, say, I'm not going to stand here and say, oh, not I. Every single person who has been entrusted with the gospel is responsible. There's not a one that can say, I didn't know or I didn't whatever, that decided to do or preach otherwise. So I'm going to tell you what, you know, when I look at this, I think to myself, we can glean a lot and we can learn a lot from an old message. 
G. Campbell Morgan once said that there are two forces at work in the world, forces which gather and bring to the center and forces which drive from the center. The forces of good and right and the forces of evil are in array against each other. If we can see how this is either acting in our life, we're either being drawn to the center, being drawn together, being by a common bond. That common bond is the blood of Jesus Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the common bond. Not gender, not skin color, not anything else. Sorry, if you came here to hear that, you're in the wrong place, okay? Uh, this is probably the most anti-woke uh, institution you will encounter standing right before you. I don't believe in any of that stuff. I'm just going to say it to you right now. Um, the reason I bring up the quote from G. Campbell Morgan is we really have to ask ourselves, are we being drawn towards the center or are we being pushed towards the outer limits? And if you can just stop for a second, not just the people in the sanctuary, the people who are outside the sanctuary, but when this message replays, just take a second, please, to answer the question, which direction are you going? Are you being drawn towards the center is Christ? The center is the things of God. Are you being drawn towards that? Or are you going to the outer circles? Because being real, where you stand is very important. If you are going to be delusional about this, nothing's going to help you. But if you can recognize, maybe I'm not so close to the center as I thought, that is the beginning of making progress with God, especially in this day and age. So if our attitude or our mindset is to pay attention to the text, and my first word here is fugi, and I'm deliberately saying it like that. It's probably not pronounced like that because I want you to remember when I say, are you fugying? You will remember the word, okay? Fugi. So this word fuge is actually a verb. And the only thing I'm going to tell you that will, so I don't have to do a big grammar lesson, is that it's in the imperative. What that means, simply put, is it's Paul's not saying, hey, can you think about fleeing? Would you mind fleeing? I think you might want to flee. He's saying, flee, as in this is a command. It's not an option. If you want to be going in the right direction here. So what are we fleeing from? Go back and read from the third verse. And I have scratched off man. And as you know, and I will keep repeating this, when the reference is to man, we're using humankind. I mean, this is not a target on men or on women. This is just a generic principle. So I say humankind. If any, teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Let me stop right there for a second. Because that is actually at the tail end. Remember I said personally? corporately, and what spills over? What is the world seeing? Well, the world is seeing a whole lot of stuff come out of the church, which is not the wholesome words and the words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine, which is according to godliness. Just, if you read, and I will not even say, there are, even within the Protestant denomination, there is now another, we'll call it schism, I believe this one has just happened in the Methodist Church because there is no agreement on who should be in the pulpit and who should be sitting in the pews. And I, don't, I will never understand why this isn't even an issue. Why should, I'm sorry, but why should I? Yes, I'm, I was born a woman. I'm a complete woman. But I'm standing here talking to you about God, which has nothing to do with my gender or an agenda. It's all about God. So if somebody takes the commission to be in the pulpit, they should put away their personal agendas. That includes their gender issues, their gender preferences, whatever it is that is your ideology to stand and preach Christ. Now what the world is seeing on the outside are people who are standing in the pulpits doing everything else but from the largest religious organization in the world, the Roman Catholic Church, what has come out is that 
global warming and climate change is of much more importance than telling people about how to be successful in obtaining more faith from the Lord or how to make your way to a turn. It's more important to tell you about climate change now. That's what I'm talking about. If any, teach not the wholesome words or the doctrine of Christ. Listen to what's being said. And again, that cannot be, I can say personally for me because I'm your pastor, but corporately as a body and then what spills out into the world. He is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions, strifes of word, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil, surmisings, perver perverse disputings of men, corrupt minds, and destitute of truth, supposing that gain is godliness from all this, withdraw thyself. Flee from this. Well, I have some notes on some of these words that are what we're to flee from. In the, remember, this is not, hey, brother, would you consider fleeing? This is like a warning, like, get out of Dodge, man, go, right? That's what it is. It's, it's, or if God's saying flee, say, yes, sir, that's it. There's no option. When it says he is proud, I have notes here, so I'm going to read off my notes. The Greek has a little bit more color. Vanity and arrogance, he has been seduced. The Greek word typhu, we get our word for typhoon from that, puffed up. In colloquial terms, full of oneself, knowing nothing. Moral and spiritual blindness that results in poor or no judgment on the part of the individual. Craving controversies. I, this is all exposited from this. It was just too much to do a translation, so I'm reading to you how I came up with this. Craving controversies and disputes. This Greek word, logo maexi, connotes the very intent to fight, out of which comes envy, strifes, blasphemy, evil, suspicions, constant friction of those who are depraved in mind, having become bereft of the truth, thinking, gain to be godliness. And if I were to dare add anything here, I'd pull something out of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, which is to flee idolatry. Anything that you're going to worship that is in the form of anything but God. And it can be anything. Our text even basically tells us the caution of the love of money. And I want to say something very important on this. It is not just the Protestant church that has really made a mockery out of this over, we'll say, the last few decades of its prosperity and all of the teachings of, you know, ask and you shall receive the kind of silly stuff we've seen over several decades. You've got literally hundreds of years out of the Catholic Church of financial, or we'll call it fiduciary irresponsibility uh, to where if, if somebody actually, I've said this before, if you actually read the history, it is so debauch, it is so wrong, it is so crooked on how it became a money machine. So very important to understand what God says about money versus what, how we perceive or understand. Um, even Luke says, a man's life consisteth not of the things he possesseth. So I go so far as to say, be careful, because there's a fine line. If you're familiar with the Bible, the Bible talks about, for example, the talents, right? You've got the one who took the, the one talent, hid it in a napkin, put it in the ground, and then the one who basically made the money or the talents work. God is not opposed to granting things to people that they might, if you read that passage carefully, that they might increase what they have for his sake because the whole premise is it belonged to him at the beginning anyway. What did you do with what he gave you to be a steward over versus thinking the thing is yours and it's in your pocket and it's yours alone and that becomes greed and becomes the root of all evil. So what are we fleeing, right? You say, just what are we fleeing? Vanity of mind, thoughts of our own grandeur being puffed up, not knowing our understanding, which, by the way, from this text, um, there is a specific word which refers to gaining knowledge by prolonged acquaintance, what comes from close and constant association without ever making applications to ourselves. 
You know what? I think that probably if we were to do some self-reflecting, I'm not asking you to do it now, we're probably all guilty of that, all of us. Hearing something that we know should be applied to our hearts, but, you know, later's soon enough, right? Okay. Craving controversies over words that spawn envy, grudge, spite, strong desires that sour over time because of a sin-laden mindset. And there is one word in here being named in the Greek, eris, which basically is a, ready, a readiness to quarrel, an affection for disputes, been always used in a pejorative way, always used in a negative. Slander. And this one I need to explain a little bit, because you think when we use the word blasphemy, that blasphemy is just taking the Lord's name in vain or something. It's not. If you read a proper de definition of blasphemy, blasphemy can re be reduced down to that which switches right to wrong and calls it what God disapproves as right. In other words, they exchange the truth of God for a lie, like Romans 125. It's not just how we tend to think, oh, it's a blasphemous speech I spoke against, but actually doing effectively against what God has already decreed, his will or his way. Suspicious evil mind with perverse disputings, basically like somebody who's a broken record over and over and over again. Totally degenerate, corrupt, a mind that is destitute of the truth, turned away from the truth by defrauding, cheating, and taking away that which perhaps lawfully belongs to someone else, greed, or false gain. So that is what we are fleeing from. You're fleeing unhealthy or not wholesome words, not according to the doctrine, which is according to this book. So if you're sitting somewhere, listening to somebody pontificate about what you need to be doing, what you ought to be doing, what the world wants you to do, what color you should dye your hair, or what gender your children should be, flee from this. Personally, flee from this. You have no business as a Christian exposing yourself personally. Now think corporately. Think about everything that I've just read. I, I, the first one's enough, but we go through them. Corporately, are you in a church? Are you listening to a message that is basically the underpinnings are greed, to gain, to profit, of someone who is proud, someone who is not humble enough before God to say, hey, I've stood here and said to you, if I have made a mistake or I've said otherwise or if things change, I'm going to tell you there's no place for ego in the pulpit. None. But if you are sitting in a corporate body, not being instructed, and you're listening to someone who is basically uh, full of hot air, not teaching you a single space in this book. Flee from that. Now, on the tail end of that, it's what spills over into the world. We can't tell the world to flee from that because the world is ignorant as to what it's supposed to be fleeing from or the dangers of whatever false doctrines are. In fact, more people are drawn to, the outside world are drawn much easier to false doctrine because usually the false doctrine is easy. It requires no thought. It just requires you to sit there and let someone spiritually massage your eardrums for 30 minutes, 20 minutes. But you walk away with nothing, no greater knowledge, no tools, no concept of anything. Now, the world, I, I'm saying to you, what spills over from this, it's understandable why there are people out there that don't want anything to do with the church. So what happens if we start making this an application personally and corporately. Now, I'm not, I'm not speaking to the here and now. I'm talking about if I was able to talk to the whole church world. Why do you go to church if it is not to learn and get closer to God? What is the purpose? Flee from these other things that are wasting your time, wasting God's time. If God called you into the kingdom, don't just say, oh, well, I'm sure God will lead me somewhere and you just do nothing about it. You are to seek. The Bible says, seek and you shall find. So we're fleeing and not in cowardice. And basically, if you want to put it this way, you are defending against invaders of the heart and mind with their bogus doctrines and their bad ideology. 
then you can say, oh, it's not very nice of you to say all this, but I don't need to be nice. If I was called as an under-shepherd, then I'm going to use the tools I have. If it's a rod to verbally beat somebody over the back of the head until they get the message, you're going in the wrong direction. And you can keep going in the direction you want. I, I'm just here to say that's not the right way. You want to keep going. Knock yourself out. The next word we're going to look at is this dioke, follow. This word is also a verb and also imperative. So once more, the text is not saying, hey, brother, you think you might want to follow thus and so? It's saying, this is basically follow. This is the way to go. Go. Flee from this and go that way. Well, what are we to follow? And now you can kind of see here we're going to get into some better stuff. It says here, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Let me please explain for a minute. Righteousness and not of your own. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is as filthy rags. This is follow after God's righteousness, which is none other than Christ, his, what his wholeness or wholesomeness brings to us, what he imparts to us for and by faith. Godliness, to be closer to him, devotion to him as a start, and that Greek word here, Eusebian, or you, good, and sibomai, godly heart response. Faith, which is a noun here, not a verb, which could easily make this a state of mind, although it's not. Could be. But it's actually a gift from God. All of these things we're looking at come from God. They are not humanly generated. So the faith that comes from God to you as a gift, and amening in his word. The next word, agapin, love. There are several Greek words for love. This one is the unconditional love which comes from God himself. Why do I say that? And I've had many people argue this with me. Romans 5 says it plainly. The love of God, the agapin of God, which is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's from God, okay? We don't have that on our own. Um, poor King James here, they use the word patience. This word here, if you've been around, should be, you should be no stranger. That word is not patience, but rather endurance. And if you remember, we broke this word up one time, so you've got hupo, and right here you could say, to dig in your heels, to take a stand, to be firm, but it is endurance. Like an athlete that will build endurance as they keep training, right? So all of this that comes from God, and the last one which always gets messed up by everybody. Ah, right? That last one is meekness. Prao, pathian is the Greek word. This is not Paul telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, can you be more milk toast than you already are? <laughs> okay? He's basically saying this meekness, rightly understood as a wonderful thing, it is, from, it is of divine origin. And I have said or described it like this many, many times. It begins with the Spirit of God at work that places the power of God in the believer under, we'll call it a controlled force. So I've used this analogy before. We're wild horses. God gets the bit and bridle. We let him with full power. He has full power to control how much or how little in a measured way. That is, think about it. Meekness must be understood. It's not just simply, you look up definitions that say it's being gentle. No, that's actually only one part of it because there's power comes from God, granted to us, that when God is basically holding the reins, he's got the power in check. He's making sure it's not getting out of control. It's not weak. It's not gentle as in lame. 
it's enough to get the point across and to empower us or to equip us. So do not think that this word meekness uh, is something of a weakness word. It is not. Uh, in fact, I'd say there's a passage out of Matthew. You're familiar with it in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. If you read that in proper context, you'll see it would be more along the lines of blessed are the, those God governed in heart. Those who have basically taken the bit and bridle of God, they shall inherit the earth, not the ones who are just saying, eh, whatever they're doing, and that's, <laughs> that's their business. All right, so that brings us to the last of these words we're looking at, agonizu. This is also a verb, and it is also imperative. You see it in the Greek, and you recognize that there is something to be said by the grammar, to fight, and not just fight, here, roll up your sleeves, fight the good fight of faith. Put the whole thing in perspective. It doesn't say lay down and pray for somebody. It doesn't say hold hands. It doesn't say um, stick it out. It says fight the good fight of faith. Flee, follow, fight. Let me backtrack for a second because in the concept of following, let me make the application personally, corporately, and then what spills over into the world. So if we are following after God's righteousness, his godliness, faith, love, endurance, and meekness, and these are all, by the way, for the most part, in the accusative, if you know grammar, it means it's pointing the finger somewhere. Think about what that might mean for you. Um, but if we're applying this follow to ourselves first personally, when it says follow after these things, righteousness of God, godliness, faith, love, endurance, meekness. I have to ask myself personally what that means for me. And maybe ask the question, is my faith grip as strong as it used to be? Am I, am I following as an imperative? Or am I following kind of like in a comfortable state or a stupor? Do you understand what I'm saying? If a church is a people that belong to the Lord, if a church is the outcalled ones of God, and corporately you are putting up with and standing in a zone that is basically accepting everything else but, you are essentially going against God. And I know that may sit wrong with some people to say it that way, but that's the bottom line. This is the problem, is no one wants to acknowledge what the problem actually is that has made the church so impotent and such a joke to the world. What spills out into the world? Do you think that people looking outside inward, do you think they are seeing people pursuing the righteousness of God or godliness or faith or unconditional love of God, endurance or meekness? What does the outworld world see? Well, they open the TV and they see somebody raising money because they're selling you a holy cloth, or it's all the gimmick stuff, or it's the social issues, or it's every other agenda but the agenda that's supposed to be in the pulpit. So corporately, and then the spillover, because the corporate concept has completely left following after these principles, the spillover is what the world sees, the garbage that comes out of the church. Now you tell me, if the Apostle Paul said that the gospel is the power unto salvation and the gospel is not being preached, how can anyone get saved? You tell me, it's rhetorical. Okay? All right, well, let's go to the last one because the last one I think might have a little bit better application here, to fight. So let me first talk about the word and say a few things here. We see, by the way, we've got a verb and a noun. Agonizu is the verb, agona. In the King James, you can see it's fight, the good fight. They're the same in the English. Um, if you were looking this word up, you would see that when Christ was in the garden, he prayed in agony. Everything that he had, he prayed with that force. So 
fighting is not just, don't just think of it as an act of violence. Think of it as everything that's within you as Christ prayed in the garden. That's one. Luke uses this word to tell us how to strive to enter in to the kingdom. That striving, if you think about it, has to be linked to faith and being in the word of God. So struggle, battle, contend for, and it is not an option for the believer. So if we're looking at all this, and I'm trying to put all this together, let me just kind of take a few steps back now. First, the first battle we're fighting is in our own mind and in our own heart and in our own life. And why is that? Because I believe what the Apostle Paul said. Remember, he wrote somewhere that what he wanted to do, he found himself not doing. That's human nature. The desire, how many of you people have you heard say, I'm, this year I'm going to attend church, I'm going to, be, I'm going to be more faithful, I'm going to pray more. They'll say anything, right? We've all done it. Come on, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. We've all done it. And then you've opened your mouth, but you don't do what you said you wanted to do, even though you, you said what you wanted to do, but you end up not doing it. That's because the flesh has great power, and unless you're fighting it in the spirit, the flesh is always going to try and find its way to take hold and push away the spiritual. So I want you to see this as a constant battle, identifying and overcoming through faith in Christ, not in yourself, not in a person, but in Christ, allows you or one to recognize, perhaps even eventually, even start to master or at least initially understand the things that you yourself are wrestling with or fighting against on a regular basis. And please do not think, when I say this, and I'm really trying to be as blunt as I can, the more malignant the mindset, envy, greed, pride, malice, hatred, revenge, at some point we all deal with things of this nature. It's not like, oh, this is just that person over there. All of us have to deal with this. So if you think about it, we're equally fighting in, internally against these things taking root, controlling us. And guess what? Once they take root of you, it's very easy for it to spread like a disease through the corporate body. You know, people talk, they gossip, they like to socialize, or they call it that, right? doesn't take much. So you have to be constantly thinking about this. And as I said earlier, we've all wrestled with doubts. That is going to happen to all of us. But questions of certainty versus faith, the love of the world versus the things of the world, these are all battles that we're all engaged in to one degree or another. So if you think about this, I'm kind of trying to point out, I think there's, there are even people who would like to receive the blessings of God, the tangible blessings of God, without even acknowledging the one who has bestowed or blessed them. That's a common thing I see everywhere. So let's not be deceived. This warfare is not confined to the inner person or the inner person alone, but we know that temptation strikes every human. And please do not make this other thing a, a, a nut, nutty thing. People, when I say temptation, the first thing people go to is sexual. Temptation can be just about anything you can think of. C.S. Lewis said, his, said it the best. Don't think of necessarily the most lewdest things. Curling up beside the fireplace to read a good book versus curling up to read the good book. There's a temptation that, right, if you put it in your mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the Bible, and then you pick up another book instead. Temptation takes on many shapes and forms according to the person's weakness. These are the things we are fighting against. There's, there's an outward enemy I'm going to also address that assaults the believer, and it's two-pronged. You can be ignorant towards the things of God and what you don't know, thinking, trust me, we all have been there. I'm being completely honest with you. We've all been there. You come into the church, 
an ignorant babe. We all do. You think you know everything, you know everything, you, you got it all figured out until you actually get serious about learning and then you realize how much you don't know. And this is coming from someone who's in the Word every week and I realize how much I don't know and how much more I need to learn. So there's, that's something you have to fight against. Ignorance of what you don't know. So how do you fight against that? You find a place, whether it's here or some other church, where someone is opening up the Word of God, opening up the Word, showing you their meaning, stretching your mind a little bit for spiritual growth. Not for weird stuff. For you to have a closer relationship with the Lord. Not with me. You're not going... I might see you in heaven, but I'm not taking you with me, and you're not taking me with you. You'll each be responsible for your own trip, and it starts right now. Think about that. So when I say fight against this, fight against the ignorance that you think you know everything. It's only a smart person who can turn around and say, I don't know, and I need to look into, and I don't have all the answers. A smart person knows how much they don't know. So you fight against the ignorance of what you don't know, but you also have to fight against something on the other side of the ignorance is what other people don't know, not just what you don't know. The world outside looking in, they look in on the church, and I know because I've talked to many people about this. I can tell you the ignorance of the world looking in will make its judgments. You know how many people have come into this church? They've been enamored with the teaching, but then they'll catch the ear of somebody, a friend or somebody, and they'll say, oh, but that church doesn't have a regular service. They're, they're not on their knees. They're not, they're not crossing themselves. They're not doing an altar call. They're not doing tons of music and tons of this and tons of that or tons of that. <laughs> what do you think the first church looked like? What do you think the early church looked like? Do you think that when Jesus gathered his little band or when Peter stood up in the upper room or the first century churches, do you really think that they were focused on, come on now, we have a, a carnival huckster here. Come on in, we're going to give you the greatest show on earth here, selling tickets right now. Get your money out. Come on, come on. Do you think that that's the way the first century church worked? Because it did not. It worked just like this. Maybe not exactly just like this, but when I say Here's the message. They may have prayed, they may have sung songs together, but it was a simple gathering based on one thing that Christ said. Go into the world and make learners. Teach the people. There was never an inclusion of entertainment or other doctrine. In fact, Paul tackles that and says, anybody who teaches any other doctrine than the doctrine that you've received, let him be anathema. So why are we wrestling with this concept? Because people are no longer paying attention to this. And if we apply it, as I said, personally, corporately, and then we see what spills over, you begin to see that a lot of the problems we are facing start right here in the house of God, every house of God, not just this house, every house of God. And I don't care. Now I'm going to say something that people might get offended by, but I do that so good. I don't care if you are a Jew, if you are going to synagogue because you know why you're going to synagogue. You don't just go to synagogue because eh, oh, we, we go, this is how we go. You don't just go to church because this is what we do Sunday morning. Don't go to mosque because you want to bend down on somebody's rug because that's what we do. Know what, what it is you're doing and be certain of it and be sure of it. Educate yourself in this word, and that's part of following and fighting on a much larger level. So we understand we put all this together. I want you to think of another thing. When we are contending for the faith that comes from him, that is, faith that comes from God, that basically reveals God to us, opens up our eyes to be even interested, that gives us Christ as the revelation of God in the flesh and eternal life and that the victory is ours. What does the scripture say? It says, 
the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. That tells me this is a lifelong battle that we have to keep fighting. Fight the good fight of faith. It doesn't say fight the good fight of, ah, I'm going to clock you on. You may do that in, in an action-type way <laughs> in your mind, but we're talking about how the battle is won. Remember, as I said, it's, it's a fight, a fight of faith. Now, for decades, we've had a definition of faith here that's helped people remember. Faith is an action based upon belief, sustained by confidence. It, it is an action word. It requires, in this case, if I'm talking about the faith that one must contend for or fight the good fight of faith, we're talking about an action word that requires you reading this book, sustained by the belief, the confidence, and sustained by the belief that what is in here, what God has said, is God's word. It's true. It's not just a bunch of archaic Messages written down for somebody to play with your mind, but it has the power to save. All of this must be put into the equation, personally, corporately, and as I said, the spillover. Now, you might say, well, I'm, I'm checking the box. Uh, I go to church once a month. There are other people who say, I go to church every Sunday. There are other people who say, oh, I go to church once a year, right? That's how they check the box. I'm asking you, please, and I'm, I'm asking you, just think about this. Why even bother going to church if you're not learning anything? Why even bother coming into a building that we are, traditionally, we say we're in God's house, the things of God, the, we, we, we're supposed to be talking about God's word, lifting up the word. Why even bother? Because you've already defeated the purpose when you say, oh, I should go to church when there's nothing to receive going to church. I'm not, I'm not trying to talk people of going to church. You may think, what, what's she saying? She's trying to talk us out of going to church. No, I'm saying you find a place that feeds your soul, that educates you. And these, the reason why I highlighted these three words, flee, follow, and fight, is because I believe if you had no other instruction and you were just operating on these three words as somebody just coming into the church, unfamiliar with anything, you'd at least say, okay, I can, I can wrap my mind around what I'm supposed to flee, what I'm supposed to follow, and what I'm supposed to fight for or by or even against at some point, depending on how you're aiming this. So what I want to kind of bring this to a maybe better conclusion is I think when people are sure about specifically what's in this message, flee, follow, fight, and there's something more. Wait, I, should, I shouldn't be remiss to do this. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called. So let me ask you a question. I'm sure hoping that people have listened to me long enough to answer. Did God call you? Yes. Did God choose you? Yes. All right, well, so if God called you, and he chose you, it also says that you are called to what? To lay hold on eternal life. So how does that process even begin to work? Do you remember, and I've often quoted this scripture, it seems to be one of my favorite ones, John 17, this is life eternal. This is life eternal. Don't think chapter and verse. Hear what I'm saying. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the one true living God. This is life eternal, that they may know thee and his son, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. This is life eternal. Life eternal does not begin by talking about climate change or about children's sexuality or about whatever else. This is eternal life, that they may know. So how do you get to know God? Eh, at least five people said it. <laughs> you, look, you start dating somebody. How do you get to know them? You decide, I think I want to marry that person. But you don't do that unless you've... Now you talk about, 
I think I'm learning about God and the principle is I'm going to spend eternity with God. Wouldn't you want to spend time with him here and now to get to know? I'm sorry to say it. God, I don't mean to be blasphemous, so please forgive me for this. But wouldn't you want to know? Now, I, I read the Bible and I think I, I want to spend eternity with God, but wouldn't you want to know a little bit more about who you're supposedly spending eternity with? Yes. Instead of, well, I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I bought a lotto ticket and that's good enough. I'll put it in my back pocket and... You know, when the numbers are called, we'll see what happens, you know, right? So now let me just give you a, a little idea now of, of how to put this all together because I think a lot of times when we see this, these words, it can get a little maybe overwhelming. You know? Flee, follow, fight. So what's the takeaway for all this? And I'm going to tell you what the takeaway is. If you take those three words, if you write them on the side of your Bible somewhere, and if, even if you should forget everything else that I said, those three words, and you go back and you reread from verses 3 all the way to pr pretty much the end of the chapter, of, the sixth chapter of Timothy. You'll find great clarity in something. And I'm not saying you're going to flee all these things perfectly and you're going to fight all these things perfectly, but first part of the battle is recognizing tactically what you're up against, looking at and giving a right we'll call it appraisal, of what you're up against. And in this case, there are things you can't even see, the unseen forces, the principalities and powers that Paul talks about of Ephesians 6. So the beginning of wisdom here and the beginning of understanding God is looking at his word and even with a little bit of grammar, recognizing God's not through the Apostle Paul saying, if you'd like to do this, this might help you. Paul's saying, as a mouthpiece of God, if you will flee, not discussable. If you'll follow, not discussable. And if you'll fight, not discussable. I, the Lord, will give you the victory. It may not come in the blink of an eye, but I'll give you the victory because ultimately he decides the outcome based on something very crucial that's in here. You and I, but each one has to do it for themselves, fighting the good fight of faith. Agonize the good agony. I hope you can see why this is such a crucial message for people to receive. It is not to be taken lightly, and I'm earnestly praying for people to actually get some grit and begin to get serious about fighting against all these things that have basically not only torn at the tapestry and the fabric of the church, but they're actually tearing down and wearing apart the fabric of our nation. And if you think about that, born as a Christian nation, we don't look like one anymore. We could sure use some spillover from the church, and it doesn't mean we go out and we demonstrate. It just means a light cannot be hidden. You go out and you be as you are, and if you're really what I'm talking about, fleeing, following, and fighting, it's seen. It doesn't even need to be articulated. What is why is that person standing so firm? Why are they not afraid of the current circumstances? What's their problem? Well, I can tell you what problem they don't have. They're standing on the solid rock, Jesus Christ, bathing and trusting and fighting the good fight of faith. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.